Now, we're turning our attention to an interesting study out today on teenage girls in this country and their participation, or lack of, when it comes to uh, sport. So what happened here was that Sport Ireland commissioned women in sport to establish how to encourage teenage girls to up their activity levels, very simply. And uh, the results are interesting, and we thought we'd have a discussion about them. Very happy to say Nora Stapleton is with us. She is the women in sport lead and uh, carried out this study in conjunction with Sport Ireland, former Irish international rugby player as well, of course. And Emer O'Neill, a woman of many talents, PE teacher. You'll see her on the RTE Homeschool Hub. She was in the show a couple of weeks ago talking about the issue of racism, and it's well worth uh, checking out that conversation on podcast or on our uh, social channels as well. Emer, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me back. No, you're very welcome back. By the way, I read your interview with Shane McGrath in the Mail on Sunday at the weekend and was uh, shocked slash disgusted and holding my knee when I discovered you had eight knee surgeries as part of your US basketball yeah. career at college. Just the eight. I know, just the eight. And actually, he may have omitted the ankle surgery on the same leg. No, <laughs> that was there as well. That was there as well. So you're hobbling around. <laughs> <laughs> hobbling around. I'm half the woman I used to be. <laughs> well, we have you very much here as a PE teacher, and it's great to get some, I think, on the ground feedback as to what you're seeing yeah. or what you're not seeing. Uh, Nora Stablin, yeah. you're very welcome as well. Thanks very much, Joe. Yeah, it's great to be on. So uh, just to give people a sense of the methodology here, it's always interesting, how do we compile these stories, uh, studies or what's the best way to do it? I mean, I was looking through the full report and there was like a lot of interview processes, I think with 31 girls, different parts of the country and interviews with, you know, a teacher, a parent or a sports provider as well, or you got the girls together in pairs and interviewed them that way as well. That was the way you tried to get a sense of where they are in their own life and, and how sport fits into it. That was the, the general plan. Yeah, you've pretty much summarized it quite well there. And um, I think the big thing with those interviews, there was a lot of online work where Women in Sports, the UK company that you mentioned, they tracked the girls' activity online and they encouraged them to, you know, to do blogs and to post images of what they see sport is. Um, and that was really interesting. So a lot of the comments and quotes that were taken from the girls, they were all things that they posted themselves online. So it really gave us an idea of their lives and what they do day to day and then their attitude towards sports. So that was a big thing for us, like what's their attitude towards sport? What are the barriers, the challenges that they experience? What's important in their lives? And then what can we actually do about it? Um, women in sport, to give a bit of context there, they have, they've done this type of work before. So they've done it with teenage girls in the UK. So. Um, we were able to draw on a lot of previous work that they've done and then we worked with a consultant, an Irish consultancy firm who linked us up with the girls here. So that's what brought the Irish context or uh, context, and then obviously the other stakeholders. So it was really interesting. There was a bit of compare and contrast with teenage girls in the UK, mm. but by and by it was very similar. Um, I think maybe the main difference was in the UK, teenage girls have more a different relationship with their parents. In particular their mother compared to Ireland the biggest uh, relationship factor in Ireland is the teenage girls and the relationship they have with their friends uh, was the most important thing whereas in the UK it was with their mum so that was the main difference and look we've we'll probably go through some of the stuff we found but for us it, it wasn't just about getting research but looking to see how do we map research with the insights that we're gathering and then how do we develop a resource or a tools in order to help sports or help people make it make a difference with the information that we find because quite often i find we do all this research and then nobody knows what to do with it so we're trying to take it one step further there's loads in the report like for instance you're, you're, you're trying to get a sense of where teenage girls we're talking about them and the report makes this point like it's one homogenous group who think and act in exactly the same way there's obviously huge uh, variations i'm sure amongst many different individuals but in broad terms Generation Z, four plus hours on the phone a day. Uh, preoccupations include everything with, you know, obsessions with selfies and appearance is a huge issue at the moment. There's online bullying and some uh, girls limiting their online use as a result. There's increased academic pressure, which is, you know, I, I think a, a, a generational thing as well. Each generation as we go by has more of a pressure, I think, to perform academically. A uh, sense of belonging, just bored is kind of a thing as well. Reasons for not getting involved in sport then. No friends involved. No friends involved was a big reason. A uh, fear of embarrassment was another reason. A uh, schoolwork pressure was another reason. 
a couple gave a reason that there's just nothing out there they enjoy. And the most powerful uh, barrier, Nora, was I'm not good enough. As in, I'm not of a sufficient standard to play with you know, my, uh, the others my age at whatever the chosen sport is. So maybe, and that's often based on a limited experience starting out. So, you know, maybe they went to football training twice, weren't that good, didn't enjoy it, and, and pretty quickly concluded, I'm not good enough to play this sport, so I'm not going to. You, you said that was the most powerful barrier you found. That, yeah, that and the I'm not sporty and the tagline or the kind of perception of what they think sporty is. So the I'm not good enough, like it, it's, such a shame, isn't it? And it was surprising in a way that that's what came through really strong. Um, you said there that, you know, it could be girls going to football and trying it out a couple of times and leaving. It's not even so much that, you know, it was um, a team sports, I suppose, certainly there was a strong voice from the girls where they had a negative experience seemingly within the team sports. Um, but we all know like team sports in Ireland, they're fantastic. The sport is fantastic. So it's not to say that it's, or because of team sports, um, that's not the case. But those girls who labeled themselves as not good enough, um, it could have been that the the competition element or the challenge that they were experiencing within those sports maybe wasn't what they wanted to experience, or they felt that they weren't good enough to be part of the team. It was embarrassing then to try and train with the team mm. when the team were more focused on winning matches or you know maybe getting to a higher level of performance on the pitch whereas they were there because it comes back to obviously the social elements they were there with their friends they enjoyed it they liked being challenged because you know girls do like being challenged when they're involved in sport and um, but it was at a level that they felt i'm a weakness now in the team and then they felt like they were being judged by their teammates and so rather than go through all that they just left so that was a big thing around the leaving or the dropout um and it's only one area like that no judgment um is one area and how do we get rid of that no judgment or that feeling of i'm not good enough um is a big it's going to be a huge challenge but mm. i think it's really great that we've identified that and we can talk about it emer secondary school teacher what are you seeing on the ground is it single sex school or both emer um, I'm in a mixed school, yeah, so, um, but I myself went to an all-girls school. Um, <clears throat> to be honest, you know, listening, it's, it's funny because, like, I don't have to have even seen any of this research, but I can concur with the results just by what I see with my own kids in school. Um, I think the first issue probably is that in primary school, when you're getting the foundation for the prereq for a lot of skills and to be able to, let's say, play team sports, because in primary school level over here, we don't actually have physical education teachers teaching PE. It's just, you know, the classroom teacher. And it's the same if you think of anything, right? So you don't like maths or you don't like history, but if you have a really good maths teacher or a really good history teacher, you, you get the sense of confidence, I suppose, because you're learning more and you start to enjoy the subject a bit more. And I think the same goes for the likes of PE. So if you have a primary school teacher, let's say in fifth class, that, you know, just really isn't into sport and, you know, I suppose PE consists of maybe rolling out a ball and he's have a bit of crack in the yard, like you're not actually learning any fundamental skills there as such. And there is a primary school curriculum, but a lot of the time what I'm seeing is that it's not actually being followed because when I get students into the secondary level, I find that they don't have the prereq skills that they need to actually access the secondary school curriculum. So what I'm finding is I'm having to dip into the primary school curriculum and come right back into, you know, just throwing, catching, even running fundamentals um, before I can even get into team sports or anything like that. Um, I, in the States, so I'm qualified to teach K through 12, which would be from primary all the way through to secondary, because in the States, in the primary school level, you have a qualified PE teacher that's gone to college for four years and has a degree in, you know, what they're doing. And I think that's a huge deficit that we have in this country. So what I see too is like a, a student that comes to me in secondary school, a girl that is quite proficient, it's actually because of something outside of school. And then 
that kind of is a bit of a snowball effect because it kind of de depends on maybe your socioeconomic background, whether or not maybe you can afford to do extracurricular activities outside of school or like, for instance, my son, like a, a lot of it is to do with having that time to even be able to do it. Like, you know, he has training sessions three times a week and thankfully my husband is really good at making sure he gets there to all those sessions. So if you don't have kind of that family backbone pushing it as well and being there to make sure that the kids get to their sessions um, or financially that you can afford to even pay for the outside sessions, kids by the time they're 12 and 13 are so behind those that have actually maybe done a sport outside of school. And that's where that massive deficit, I think, comes. And then the fear of not being good enough, not being picked, being one of the huge issues I see in PE. Um, and of course, that not being sporty. But I think we need to change that concept of I'm not sporty and think more about health and well-being. So to maybe not use that word sporty anymore, because like sport covers such an array of things and females in general studies kind of show that they do pr prefer individual sports as opposed to team sports and so the likes let's say of you know dance aerobics um athletics uh gymnastics swimming and in PE in Ireland, those subjects are very rarely covered in the PE curriculum because we don't have access a lot of the time. Um, and also maybe a fear of the subject. So itself, like, so swimming, I'd say there's maybe 5% of schools, if even that in the country that have access to actual swimming as a part of their PE curriculum. Um, not to mention gymnastics. I know a lot of PE teachers would feel a little bit tentative to go into that area because there is such a high risk of injury and you really need to be quite you know well educated when it comes to gymnastics mm. even do it and then the topic of dance that's another one you know because you think oh well the kids like especially if you're in a mixed school now the boys will be they won't like to do this so we just won't do it the lads will be messing then in the class and she will just scratch the whole thing we won't do dance and so then again the girls miss out again on something that they probably would have really liked so like within my my class like we do we try to do new things like yoga pilates bring in meditation and try and and get them to find a love for something and understand that walking is a sport hiking is a sport you know going out and um, riding your bike is a sport you know that you know you don't have to think of it all the time necessarily as a team sport where you need to be getting physical and you know and i'm not saying that there aren't loads of girls out there that love that aspect of me being one of them you know that was but it's just not always for everyone so i think it's so important that we're not finding that drop off you know, and we're only really ensuring that those team sports kids are being facilitated for, but individual sports, not so much. Yes. Well, look, you've really touched on something that blew up on the show maybe a month or two ago. We had Professor Niall Moyna on talking about our general fitness, and he was talking about all ages, but certainly when we got into school going age. There was a UCC study recently which showed that the basics of, you know, physical literacy, be it throwing a ball, bouncing a ball, catching, rolling, knowing how to fall, running, all these motor skills that should be mastered early on. When they're arriving to you, Emer, at 12 years of age, they're nowhere near. And so your experience tallies with that uh, survey completely. And so, you know, it's fairly obvious probably what's happened in that society has changed so much. And the days of like, go out and I'll see you in five hours and unsupervised play and climbing a tree and, you know, doing different things with your mates in urban areas, certainly that has all declined massively and it's not coming back. And what we're left with, is a national school syllabus where, as Emer says, it's a you know real lottery as to the quality of national school, primary school teaching you're on the receiving end of. And even if it's good, it's only an hour a week, you know, and there's no dedicated PE teacher. So really, I mean, if, if we're looking at this um, study and it's saying that teenage girls by the age of 12, 13, 14 are writing themselves off as not sporty, it's too late then. So. I mean, Emer, the fairly simple solution is we need a complete overhaul of our national school PE curriculum. Like, one hour a week, you know, th this is a country where it gets dark early, where, you know, as I said, kids, kids aren't out anymore. I mean, really, physical literacy, it's one of the most important things any of us can learn. It should be an hour a day. And I would have 
when I was teaching PE in the States, my kids had PE every single day. They had an hour of PE every day, every class, one hour, every single day. Right. That's why when I came back here, you know, people ask what other subject do I have? And I said, I don't have another subject because in the States, having a physical education degree is a big thing and it's important and you will get all of your hours of PE. Whereas here, you know, the kids, like I'm lucky in my school and I fought for it that my kids would get a double class of PE week. Um, and even with that, like that's kind of unheard of in most schools. Most schools like that, it is just one hour and then come fifth and sixth year, it becomes optional. So they don't even have to do it. Mm. Nora, that's what Jim said to me, I must say. I mean, when, when these teenage yeah. girls, 12, 13, 14 years of age, as I said, are writing themselves off as just not sporty, it's not for me. It's way too late there. Like, we're going to have to get stuck into this national school situation very quickly, be it a, a designated PE teacher who looks after three or four schools in a local area. Yeah, I wouldn't um, disagree with Emer's points there. I think they're spot on and, and your own. Um, that's probably a lot, like, that is a long-term approach, isn't it? And I think- Is it though? Is it? Like, I, I, well, genuinely, well, is that not like a, you know, because we're, we're going to have various plans, five-year plans, 10-year plans, on we go. This would strike me as something government could do, you know, in, in real politic time overnight. Like within the next three, four, five years, if there was a real concerted effort, I don't see why we couldn't have the national school PE syllabus completely overhauled. Like, I, do, I don't actually see why that's long term. I think the no, the decision doesn't have to be long term, but I think seeing the effects of it. So if we're looking at the girls now who are the, the 13, 14, 15 year olds, you know, it's what, five years or three years since they left primary school. And those fundamental movement skills, the laying down period of those is kind of between the age up to under 12. Um, but the age of eight, nine, ten is essential as well. So, like I completely agree with fundamental movement skills and physical literacy. I worked for the GA where that was a huge part of all the coaching that we did in primary school, running, jumping, throwing, catching. So, I'm a full supporter of it. I think you know that we have to look as well that in the report here, it's not just about their ability, but even they talk an awful lot about opportunities as well and lack of awareness and opportunities. So. Teenage girls are saying they want to try new things, but they don't know where to try them. So they don't only talk about their own abilities in sport. Um, and I think that's a really important thing that we have to acknowledge because not every girl is, you know, wanting to join a sport because they want to be, they want to win medals or play for Ireland or represent their country or their county. And we have to be okay with that because there should be a place for every single girl to participate. And I think we need to, and like 100%, what we have to do is focus on how do we ensure the opportunities exist where there's more adventure, more excitement. They've said to us they want to do more activities outdoors. They want to do more hiking, climbing, um, off-road biking, dance, all these type of activities. And so like our key aim here now has to be how do we deliver that? And would the state, and also, uh, would the, sorry to interrupt, would the state not be the obvious answer? Because even there was a 17 year old girl and it was such a sad comment to read. She said, uh, we're Northsiders. I have a few friends in sports, that, but they're from well off families. It's not the culture here for girls to be into sports. You know, like the social aspect of this is significant as well. It would strike me, Nora, at national school level, if you have six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old girls, 11 year old girls, trying out those different things, you know, like an hour at national school a day, it can be dance, it can be a walk, it can be, you know, a, any number of things which might uh, catch their interest. But that's a way, that's a catch all way to look after urban areas, rural areas, uh, different social classes. Is that not the quick way to short circuit this problem? I think it can be one of the ways okay. um, possibly. And then I think you even have to look at um, additional interventions in first year, for example, in secondary school, because, well, you know, when you look at primary school kids, they, there's activity levels there and th those are measured. And, you know, when we talk about the national, um, the national targets, it's all about 60 minutes a day or one hour a day. And yes, not enough primary school children are doing that, that amount. But when they go to secondary school, we know that there's a huge drop off there. And um, so it isn't just primary school, we then have to look at, okay, first year and secondary school, what interventions have to go and maybe you continue some of the ideas that are discussed here into secondary school for the first, second year. Um, 
But again, as we've touched on, it has to be more about other opportunities. Like when we looked at the most popular or the most common sports played in secondary school for girls, it was basketball, soccer, uh, football, like GA football and mogi. So all team sports. So is it that the girls wanted to play those sports? Are those the sports that we gravitate towards and they're the only ones that we offer? Um, and so I think, you know, when I say long term, short term, in the short term, these are the conversations I think we need to be having. Um, when we're when we have secondary school girls now, what are we going to offer them next week? What are we going to offer them next year? Because they're saying to us like they understand the benefits of exercise. They know it's good for their mental health. And um, they know they want to be involved. Emer mentioned the individual versus team sports. The individual sports they gravitate towards um, more often, certainly. But they actually want to do those individual sports in a in a group setting because they still want to be with people. Uh, but they just don't like the yeah. intensity yeah. that comes from team quite often. Again, Again sorry, I'm 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 making the same point over and over. So I'll make it for the last time. Again, everything you've said, I just think a national school setting is perfect, and it gives them a base when they head into secondary school, where they've a, you know more of a confidence, and all the things Emer is talking about come to the fore. Then, Emer, do you want to come in on on any of this? I hope you understand what uh, Nora is saying there, as far as you know what to do with secondary schools, because you have a lot of different things that come into play when it comes to secondary school level. So let's say the skill wise was on par, and they were proficient and ready to go then you have a lot of I don't want to look stupid in front of the lads I don't want to sweat I don't I'm afraid of how I look I'm my body um there's a lot of then those issues that then start coming into play as well that need you know kind of they need to be looked at yeah. and ultimately like that I know the, the most important thing is not that they go on and play for Ireland or for their county or anything. What you want is for them to find something that they can fall in love with, that they can have. So when they're having a bad day, that they use it as a positive outlet, you know, and I think it's, that's a really great thing to have. Also, even going on to third level education, you know, that you can find a group so quickly because you, you like to walk. So you now you've got instant friends in your walking group um, and just a lovely way to keep yourself um, healthy and fit and, and mentally in a good place. And again, that is is so important that we we generate that within that secondary school level. I think mm. that's where they really will get that love and understanding because they may have brought some negative feelings about exercise and activity from primary school, but there's still a ch an opportunity to change that in the secondary school level as well. It's interesting, Emer. You mentioned that thing of body image, and I don't want to sweat, and I'm conscious about how I look. That wasn't in this survey. Now, I don't know, was there embarrassment about mentioning that? And But but that is a reality, because I expected to see that in the survey and it wasn't a big team at all. But you're, are you seeing that on the ground? Oh, I see that in the classroom uh, every day. That's that's a thing. And I know when I first came back to Ireland from America, um, I did a lot of sub work. And when I would come into the class, I'd see all the girls just sitting over across against the, the wall, you know, on the benches, and the lads would come up to me into the front. And I'd take attendance and I'd say, like, girls, well, you know, why are you sitting over there? And they'd say, well, you know, Mr. or Miss, whoever, like, doesn't, we don't have to do PE. And I'm like, what do you mean? And they'd be in their uniforms and they're like, oh, and then it would, all the excuses would come. I, ha I don't have my gear. I have a note from my mom. And, and that would be a huge thing. Like, the parents would literally be writing notes to get their kids out of having to even do PE or if their friend that day is not doing PE suddenly they don't have their gear and and a lot of that happens with the girls but not so much ever with the lads and mm. um, but for me I would say well you don't have your gear no problem you can play in your skirt come on in and it does bring in loads of aspects because it is a little bit unfair again if you're in a uniform school they are wearing skirts and if they don't bring their gear but I noticed that the more I, I said that you can play in your skirt then the next day at PE, you better believe they had their gear, you know, and I think it's just, a, a, it's a culture within a school and it's as a PE teacher, your expectations for your kids. And I think also coming at from as a female to female to female as the PE teacher, you know, the, well, uh, miss, you know, um, I'm, I'm on my cycle this month. I say, well, that's actually really good. Just free exercise, getting up and around will really help if you have cramps or anything like that. So that's squash it, squashes that straight away, you know. Mm. And also just that I, you know, as a woman, you'd say, this is really good for you. Like I can see loads of possible um, potentials for, you know, happiness in your life if you can find some area and activity that you'll enjoy. And I can even just explain some of my, my background and stuff to, to get them on board. So I do think also it's important that they have access to seeing more females that have um, 
not only just success in, in an actual career or pro career or playing mm. for their country, but just somebody who, let's say, like I have a friend that would not have liked PE. She was the one that was always forgetting her gear, but now she does CrossFit and she's a personal trainer and she absolutely loves that individual side of working on her body and working herself. And it gives her such a release from a stressful day-to-day -day life yeah. that she would never realize that she had that love and she didn't until she was in adulthood. But it would have been great for her to have found that in secondary school and had that the whole way through and all through college, you know? Mm. So. There's a lot of work to be done in the secondary level as well and yes, to make sure, sure that they're forced that's uh it's really interesting i might come in there on the yes, role model yes. side of things because um we we talked to them about role models and they kind of said you know the role models that we tend to see in sport are the really sporty role models and they're like but sure i'm never going to be like that so you know, when we show all these fantastic images and posters and interviews with irish athletes county players we're talking, we're preaching to the converted and, and we're talking to the younger girls or the young adults or the teenage girls who want to and aspire to be that, but we're not talking to the inactive girls. So for us, that's like, right, we need to completely change um, yeah. who the influencers are for these girls and who yes. we get to talk to them and who they're going to resonate with. And, and like they came into the whole micro and macro trends as well. So they'd be more interested in listening to someone like examples you used there Emer, but listen to someone who's into sustainable fashion and now enjoys running or you know is now exercising and doing x y and z they're the people who they're going to um, resonate with yeah and Nora I'm right in saying that the idea of body image and not wanting to sweat and all the things Emer mentioned that she has seen and I kind of expected to see in this survey they didn't jump out massively in this survey what's your sense of that was there an embarrassment raising those issues do you think or were they there and maybe just not reflected as much in the report um, I think it's the latter because when we went back to the consultants we asked them that because we were like that's a bit weird it kind of it doesn't match a lot about a lot of what we know so um, they did say that which was even more surprising they asked the girls about exercising with boys and they kind of shrugged their shoulders and they're like yeah that's fine right. if it's something that um if it's something new exciting and something they've never tried before it wasn't an issue for them because i would have always been the type of person even you know when we talk about pe and secondary skills i don't understand skills that have boys and girls doing pe together i think it's just so off-putting for the girls um, but yet these girls were saying, no, like if I was to rock down somewhere and that was, if it was, you know, a, an activity where it was fun, exciting, there was a social element, like they all want to be able to put it on Instagram afterwards, all these things come into play and they would do it with the boys. So we're still unsure of that one. Right. Okay. <laughs> Emer, what's your sense? Would you splitting teenage boys and girls up for PE? Because it sounded like you, you, you have them both together and get them involved together. Yeah, like it's a tough one because I like the the sporty kids in the school, you know, that let's say do play for their county teams and some even represent Ireland, like they absolutely love having sport with the lads because if it was a, just all the girls, there wouldn't be as much activity. It wouldn't be as physical. And so like it's it's a very it is a very difficult one because like I end up having to put in different rules where like you can't score until at least five girls on your team have touched the ball or you know mm -hmm. you, you literally have to put them in otherwise the boys just take over the whole game and you'll find <clears throat> that the girls are not even moving they're literally stationary while the lads are sprinting and you know doing everything sweating and really getting a nice aerobic uh, exercise out of it mm -hmm. where the girls are stationary because they're being completely ignored because let's say one time that they were past the ball, they dropped it. So now it's like, don't pass to the girls, you know? So you'd have to put in rules to really ensure that there is that engagement. I like the idea of, you know, bringing in new things like that. So that it's not always maybe the activity that would suit the lads. And in fact, you know, you'd bring in something new like yoga, you'd bring in something new like Pilates and that everyone is trying it out new for the first time i think what's hard is that obviously you know a lot of lads would be very familiar with football they're out playing football every day when they get home they're in clubs they've been playing it 
since they're knee high um, and then girls don't have that same uh, skill level so obviously that's quite daunting and um, another factor that I think comes in um, too is uh, exams examination years like I find that in third year and sixth year is when I get girls come to me and say look I've talked it over with my parents and stuff and we've decided I'm gonna I'm not gonna play basketball anymore I'm not going I'm leaving the athletics team or, or it happens all it happens every year I just wait for it and, and I've tried so many different techniques to try and stop that drop off because they they don't quite get it but they're the years that they need that physical engagement more than anything and in fact helps them to retain the, the information um and, and it's and i don't know if it's a, a case of that parents you know that we need to sit down and talk with parents and express that taking your child out of sports during their examination is actually the worst thing you could do for them mm. you know that they read and it's so possible because like i i don't and i don't know about you know but i've done it myself where you know, I juggled like probably four different teams in a year while I was, you know, uh, in six year during the leaving. And that included, you know, traveling from Bray to Dublin to Drimna, back again, arriving home at 10 o'clock at night, going back into school the next day, training with two other teams. It is definitely possible. And one thing I think for me that it taught me was discipline, time management, um, and there's so many different positives to it, but where you take that suddenly out and now it's only just focus on studying you know, I think when you're told you have exactly an hour and a half to do your work in because you have A, B or C other things that you need to do, you get your work done. Whereas when you have the whole day to do it, perhaps a few Instagram posts come in, a little bit of, you know, wandering might happen. And I think that, in fact, even though parents and kids are trying to do the right thing to try and give themselves more time and more dedication to academia, the other side of the physical activity and the mental side to that is really, really suffering, mm. you know? Yeah. Uh, it was interesting, Nora, as well, that actually um, motivation was a factor. Like, there was definitely a cohort who said, look, I know this is good for me, but, you know, it's hard. And actually, some of them expressed a guilt over their physical health, and they knew I should, they, like, I should be doing this. I certainly didn't get the sentiment, and like, it would have been so disappointing if we were still getting it in 2021, but I didn't get the sentiment expressed that, they, that sport was seen as more of a male pursuit than for girls. I think there was an understanding, I should be doing this, and this is for me as well. Yeah, there, there really was. Um, and the guilt factor was, please don't tell me I should be active because it's good for my mental health. You know, that was like, I, I don't want to hear that anymore. I know that. Mm. Um, so those motivation factors, it's like, because when they when they felt like that, they did exercise kind of sporadically. So they're like, oh, I know that's good for me. I should go for a jog. And they'll go for a two or 3K jog or something like that. So, I mean, look, fair play to them. They were doing something. Mm. But the reason it was so sporadic is because they didn't have anything consistent that they were involved in. So a lot of the time, you know, when they've already dropped out of their sport and then they don't know what they can do in order to get that kind of euphoria that you get from exercise, they don't know where to find it and they don't know what that feels like anymore. Um, and when they did the joint or the paired interviews with their friends who were sporty and they were listening to their friends talk about what they got from sport, they were just like so kind of overwhelmed by it and were really a bit in awe of like, oh God, I, I don't even know what that feels like. And so that's the saddest thing. And, and and also it's kind of like, well, if we can give that to girls and let them experience that feeling of what they get from sport and exercise and a consistent level through multiple different types of activities that they might be interested in, then suddenly we've reframed it for them. Yes. And, yes. and so it comes back to that idea of sport is not just the team sports that you might have played before. Sport is so varied and so exciting. And it's everything from, as we talked about, your hiking to your cycling, to your mountain biking, to your dance, your ballet, what you know, to your Joe Wicks that you might do at home. That's if that's how you squeeze it in, that's how you squeeze it in. But um it's reframing it. And it's kind of I said at the start, you know, for us it's not just about being able to say, here's a report, off you go, and hope that people use this information. We've we've actually just later today announced um Girls Get Active Hackathon because a key message from the report as well was to give girls a voice and um, because they're seeking this independence and they want to feel empowered by the decision they make and they want to feel involved in the sport that they get to play. And um, so we're trying to 
I guess, do something a little bit different in Sport Ireland because when we talk about these opportunities, we do have a chance with our local sports partnership network to try and provide these opportunities um, in the locality. Um, and, you know, when we do that as well, because it's through the local sports partnerships, we have an opportunity to maybe reduce that barrier that might come with financial costs and things like that. So the whole idea, and particularly around this research, we were looking at, well, what might work in disadvantaged areas um, across Ireland as well. So what we're doing is we'll do this hackathon, which is basically an online brainstorming exercise. We're inviting anybody in the public to get involved, but we really, 100% want teenage girls and particularly teenage girls who don't think of themselves as sporty so that inactive teenage girls but we also want parents teachers and mm -hmm. um, researchers you know students in third level sports development officers from from different sports and things like anybody who has a good idea to get girls active we want them to get involved and share your ideas we'll work through them and we're aiming to develop four sports programs from all the ideas so we'll funnel them down through a process but our aim then is we're going to pilot these programs in four of our local sports partnerships to test the information that we've just discovered from this research and then see, okay, what have we learned from that, evaluate it, and then look to see, can we scale that up and start creating these types of sports programs around the country that teenage girls want to be part of. So that okay. is it's a longer plan, but you know we're kicking that off over the next month. So it's quite exciting to see what can come of it, really. Okay. Sounds really good, really promising. There's there's loads in this report. It's on the Sport Island website if you want to look. I mean, it's only 20 pages, so it won't take you all day either. Uh, Emer, I like I, we have a uh, we were on to Norma Foley, Minister for Education, and obviously <laughs> uh, she's got her hands full at the moment, just trying to get everybody back to school. But we are determined on the show to come back to this issue of what's happening in our national schools when it comes to PE. Uh, they're the perfect places to harness a love of activity, to make it a habit, to develop a confidence. It applies to all social classes. And, you know, just to say in defense of primary school teachers, because when we talked about this before, lots of them texted in and quite a few made the point that we, we don't have the facilities. And others said, you have no idea how nuts the curriculum is at primary school level. We have so much to get through. And I guess the, the, the truth is one of the less measurable issues is, well, how much PE did they do? And yet when you think about our health and all the rest of it, it's, it's so important and it's just not good enough in 2021 anymore. An hour a week and sometimes neglected and the quality of that hour questionable. So like, I think we're going to have to come back to that as well. But I, I like that. It's not, it's not, it, it shouldn't fall into the hands of the primary school teachers. I mean, they're already trying to, they have to teach every single subject as is and be brilliant at every single subject as is. I, I, it's, it doesn't fall on them. You mm. know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's, they have enough work as it is um, and they have a, a hu huge job in their hands, you know, to really set our youth up for their futures and, and going forth into secondary level education. The sports aspect of it needs to be, it needs to be thought about outside that box, I think. Yeah, we'll come back to it for sure. Listen, a really great chat, loads in that for people, I suspect. Nora Stapleton, uh, the Women in Sport lead with Sport Ireland on this uh, report published today, and Emer O'Neill, PE teacher. Thanks so much, appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah.